Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here. And it's been a while since we've done one of these. Not necessarily a 10 tiny details video, did one of those just a week ago. But it's been 8 months since our last Fallout 4 10 tiny details video. I'm not quite sure why we went on such a hiatus. I mean, everything was fine. I think it's mostly just been a case of me thinking, ah, I'll get around to one of those videos later, and focusing on other projects. But here we are, and this is finally happening once again. Fallout 4 may be a nearly four-year-old game, but boy did Bethesda not fill it to the brim with a plethora of easter eggs, hidden secrets, and clever references for the community to dig up. So many that even today, soul survivors can find themselves surprised by something new. So, kick back, pop open an ice-cold bottle of Nuka-Cola, set that Mr. Handy to Do Not Disturb mode, and relax, as we jump right in to yet another 10 tiny details you may have missed in Fallout 4. Part 8 Starting off, Hardware Town is an old, pre-war hardware and tool store located right on the edge of downtown Boston, just a short stroll south of Diamond City. When you first walk by the building, chances are you'll be waved down by a seemingly distressed settler, wailing about a friend she has inside the building, who she claims is terribly hurt and will beg you to follow her inside and help her out. Now, this should already be setting some alarm bells off in your head, though if you're like me and unsuspectingly follow this girl inside, you'll quickly realize that you've been bamboozled and this settler will lead you right into a raider ambush towards the back of the warehouse. Even worse, the woman herself will turn on you too. Evidently, this raider gang must have realized that they could use a phony damsel in distress to lure gullible would-be heroes into their traps. Lucky us, we are the protagonist, so overpowering these thieves shouldn't be tremendously difficult, even if they did get the jump on us. Well, funnily enough, if rather than follow that woman into the ambush when you first approach the store, you instead enter through the warehouse's back door, you'll be able to listen on some unique, otherwise hidden dialogue, where the raiders who are planning on ambushing you wonder why you haven't come through the door yet, and get into a hilarious argument. What's taking so long? I know I just saw someone out there. This one looked like a good mark, so just shut up and wait! Maybe they went around back. Should we go check the loading dock? Don't be stupid! We got two guys back there. I thought I told you to shut up! But what if- Hey, hey, hey! Told you to stop talking! Say another word, and I will make sure that you don't annoy me ever again. Seriously, though, what if- Hey! Oh! Hey! What the hell?! What? I warned him! Shut up, and make sure you're ready! Next, throughout the wasteland, a number of pre-war utility poles dot the sides of roads and sidewalks, towering over the ashes as monuments to a more civilized, advanced age of mankind. Something you may or may not have paid attention to, though, is the fact that most of these poles have small plaques attached to them. In the real world, these plaques would normally provide technical and identification information. However, in Fallout 4, all of them are exactly the same, all featuring the letters T-E-S followed by an amalgamation of numbers. This is a nod by Bethesda to their Elder Scrolls franchise, which is abbreviated T-E-S. Real quick, I know what you may be thinking. Wait a minute, Nate, these could just be random letters. However, Bethesda featured a similar easter egg in Fallout 3, where the utility poles all had plaques reading TES-04 as a nod to their previous game at the time, The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. Later on, New Vegas, which reused a lot of Fallout 3 assets, also had the same sort of easter egg. So Fallout 4 is more or less just carrying on that tradition. Coming at number 3, speaking of previous Elder Scrolls games, Grognak's Axe is a unique, well, axe that can be found at the old Hubris Comics building, based on the blade wielded by a famous fictional comic book character. 
it bears some striking resemblances to the Iron Battle Axe from The Elder Scrolls IV. Of course, the grips, the shape, and color are all similar, but even the designs on the blade itself seem to be connected. Not too much more to add. If only we could enchant this axe in Fallout 4, too. For fourth spot, the Institute quest, Mankind Redefined, is a very short, however important one. It begins when Father summons the player into a meeting following the Battle of Bunker Hill. Assuming you sided with the Institute, that is. You'll arrive before a small gathering of important Institute members and division leaders. And there, Father will announce that he's been fighting an aggressive form of cancer, and suspects that he'll pass away soon. Upon his death, you, his son or daughter, are to become the new leader of the Institute. Some of the folks in attendance of this meeting will quite reasonably be a bit upset. Their captain is about to die and they're all now expected to take orders from some guy or girl that they've only known for a few weeks. Others will be surprisingly accepting. After Sean finishes his speech and everyone gives their closing remarks, He'll briefly speak to you in private, and the quest will be completed. So you might go on to advance in a now much more complicated storyline. Alas, did you know that it's indeed possible to be late to this meeting? If the player waits a few days after being summoned by Father, and completes some other quests before finally going over to the Institute, you'll find that the meeting happened without you, and Sean will briefly scold the player for your tardiness, with some otherwise hidden dialogue. Thankfully, otherwise, the questline will still go on as normal from here. I must say, it's somewhat embarrassing to attempt to name you as my successor when you can't even be bothered to stay at the meeting. You were going to name me as the director? <sighs> Sean, I'm... Well... <sighs> I'm very sorry. Apology accepted. What did I miss? Everything, really. Our reactor is nearly ready, my physical condition is worsening, and I had intended to reveal my plans for your taking over. In the future, you'll need to consider your priorities more carefully. Being director will demand much of your attention. Halfway through at number 5, within what's left of the South Boston Police Station lies a still-functioning terminal, which documents the evidence the police department had gathered pertaining to a variety of cases prior to when the bombs fell. One of these cases is related to a woman named Nicole Connolly, abbreviated Nico, accused of Grand Theft Auto. This appears to be an easter egg poking fun at Nico Bellic, protagonist of Grand Theft Auto 4. According to the terminal, attempts to contact this suspect have thus far proven unsuccessful. They were probably busy, perhaps out bowling with their cousin Roman. Sixth, if you enter the Boston Public Library, an old, well, library, currently occupied by some very serious robots at war with super mutants, it's a long story, with McCreary tagging along as a follower, he may say the following line of dialogue. Let's be careful. No human being would possibly pile books this way. This alludes to a scene from the classic movie Ghostbusters, wherein Bill Murray comments, quote, No human being would stack books this way when inspecting a pile of novels in a library while searching for some ghosts. I'd play the clip for you, but, you know, copyright and everything. So here's the picture. Next, when Bethesda was designing the Codsworth character, they had his voice actor go back and pre-record literally hundreds of names for him to recognize the player character as. Assuming you had one of the names that was recorded, it made for a rather impressive moment to walk up to the robot and have him call you by it. Well, one of the hundreds of names Bethesda recorded was Marky Poo. Mr. Marky Poo. This comes across as a little odd, as most of the names Bethesda recorded were things like Frank, Joe, Dave, etc. Marky Poo is a little random. Well, it's a reference to Mark Tier, an effects artist at Bethesda who goes by such a nickname. Believe it or not, in Skyrim, there's even an unobtainable spell in the game's files that simply has the description, talk to Marky Poo about this one suggesting they've been calling him that for quite a while. Coming in at number 8, 
Hawthorne is a mercenary and explorer living in Diamond City. He can most often be found spending his days at the Dugout Inn. As a character, he's uninvolved in any of the game's quests, and is rather easy to ignore as a result. That said, Hawthorne has a surprisingly deep dialogue tree and backstory. He'll happily tell tales of his journeys, and comes across as an incredibly daring fellow. However, one place he refuses to visit is the ruins of Salem. He says he's always wanted to explore that area, but something about it just horrifies him. So thus far, he's kept away. While an interesting character detail, it's in fact an easter egg referencing John Hawthorne, one of the leading judges in the Salem Witch Trials. Between 1692 and 1693, numerous young women in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, specifically the town of Salem, were accused of being witches or otherwise engaging in witch-related activities. I'm, I'm serious. John Hawthorne was among the judges that heard the cases, and pushed for the harshest punishments possible. Ruling that pretty much everyone was guilty. Interestingly, the game suggests that Hawthorne is really this character's last name, as he lives with his grandmother, who's named Eustace Hawthorne. So it's possible Bethesda could be implying that he's in fact distantly related to the real John Hawthorne. Whatever the case, a spooky little detail indeed. Getting close to the end here at number 9, we set sail for the island of Far Harbor. Here, we can find Beaver Creek Lanes, an old bowling alley within the ruins of what was once the old city. Here, after hacking our way past a small onslaught of ghouls who have called this place home for who knows how long, we can find an ancient terminal, which lists the team standings of the league that used to play here back in the day. Among the teams ranked, at third place, are the Holy Rollers. The Holy Rollers is of course the name of the bowling team Ned Flanders and Springfield's Priest play on in the Simpsons TV series. Despite this comedic easter egg, all of the other team names are also pretty hilarious, including Time to Spare, Scared Splitless, it's rather amusing. And finally, last on our list, the Pip-Boy 3000 Mark IV is a trusty tool no vault dweller in the Fallout universe would dare be caught without. When we first get our hands on one towards the end of our escape from Vault 111, we'll briefly witness it go through a quick boot-up process. During this, we'll see a screen that states the device has 64 kilobytes of RAM and 38,911 bytes free. These exact same specifications are shared by the famous Commodore 64 8-bit home computer, made popular and released in the early 80s. Quite frankly, considering all it can do, the Pip-Boy should be a good deal more powerful than something like the Commodore. But no matter, the Easter egg is still appreciated nonetheless. And with that, we are going to wrap up our long overdue 8th episode of the 10 Tiny Details in Fallout 4 series. Thanks for stopping by everybody! I'm hoping to get the gears turning with this series again, and produce quite a few more of these videos, so please feel free to suggest easter eggs and fun facts in the comments section down below. It will no doubt be of great help. As always, like ratings are very much appreciated. Also, quick note, if you do enjoy these videos, you can subscribe. And if you really enjoy them, YouTube has now made it possible to enable all notifications for when a channel uploads. Which may or may not work, I don't know. Anyway, again, thanks for watching, and hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everyone.